हेलो स्टूडेंट्स वेलकम बैक टू दिस प्रोग्राम ऑफ डायस एंड इन टूडेज सेशन एज वी हैड डिस्कस्ड अबाउट द फिजिकल एंथ्रोपोलॉजी एंड द एस्पेक्ट्स ऑफ इंटरलिंकिंग इन फिजिकल एंथ्रोपोलॉजी इन टूडेज सेशन वी वुड डिस्कस अपॉन द एस्पेक्ट्स ऑफ आर्कियोलॉजी एंड हियर वेन यू टॉक अबाउट आर्कियोलॉजी हियर वी वुड ऑल्सो इंक्लूड द एस्पेक्ट्स ऑफ प्राइमेटोलॉजी राइट we will discuss about the primatology as well as archaeology and what is the corresponding interlinkage in the syllabus and when you look at these two aspects of anthropology what it is a general belief among the aspirants it is that it happens to be an alien subject it happens to be extremely theoretical subject it happens to be extremely memorizing subject so you think that it is difficult to memorize it is difficult to understand and you most of you even believe that there is nothing to understand and also the second apprehension that is present with respect to these two sections of anthropology is that you think that if you by heart you would be able to bring out an answer but here you need to understand my dear that with archaeology and primatology in this you also have an element of dynamism and most of the answers when i come across among the students that we miss this dynamism when you are writing an archaeology answer when you are writing a answer on primatology because what happens is most of you would have by hearted a set of characteristic features when it comes to the primates or when it comes to the organic evolution of human being be it australopithecus homo habilis homo erectus like or neanderthal or neanderthaloids or homo sapiens any of these you would have by hearted a set of characteristic features or when you talk about the archaeology you would have by hearted a set of characteristic features especially with respect to the tools and tool technology and that is maybe with respect to your paleolithic that may be with respect to meso neo or it might be with respect to chalk or it might be with respect to your ivc any of these you would have by hearted and there you go and write and come out but you need to understand when you look at the examiner's point of view with respect to such a subject here what you need to understand is always an element of dynamism is awarded especially in such static sections especially in that sections which are extremely factual now moving on to the different sections that are present across your paper 1 and paper 2 because you know that archaeology is present both in paper 1 as well as paper 2 here let's look at the linkages that we can bring upon especially in this aspect of archaeology i mean before we get into the linkages let's identify in which all chapters we have archaeology right the first thing is with respect to the 1.3 section and sub section c then apart from that we would also see the primatology being present with respect to 1.5 the characteristic features of primate then the phylogenetic status characteristics and geographical distribution of the different hominins and hominids then apart from that we also talk about the 1.8 of paper 1 that is with respect to the principles of prehistoric archaeology the chronology different dating methods and also different outlines of various prehistoric cultures that are seen and apart from that when we move to the other aspects we see that we would also see some elements of the archaeology being present in neo evolutionism as a theory as a field work right then again in field work traditions in anthropology because you also need to understand there are various stages there are various methods of understanding the archaeology there are different kinds of field works and the methodologies involved in understanding archaeology so that section also we have to see then again from there we move on to the paper 2 that is in 1.1 with respect to the evolution of indian culture and civilization then again 1.2 with respect to the paleo archaeological anthropological evidences from india then ethno archaeology in india so whatever i have just mentioned with respect to the various sections these are something related to the chapters of archaeology and the chapters of the primatology now when we try interlinking these aspects with respect to archaeology and primatology here when you look at this 1.3 section c it fundamentally talks about it fundamentally talks about the basic principles it fundamentally talks about the basic principles with respect to archaeology as a subject matter of study and it might be with respect to your old school of archaeology or it might be with respect to the new school of archaeology which is being discussed in this particular section and once you understand the old school and new school with respect to the archaeology and when you look at the it being one of the basic branches of anthropology from there we go on to discuss about the characteristics of primate and the phylogenetic status the characteristics and geographical distribution 
please understand my dear whenever we are discussing about this 1.5 and 1.6 one thing has to be kept in mind that when in 1.4 chapter we had discussed about something called as biocultural adaptations we had discussed about the biocultural adaptations and when you talk about this biocultural adaptations what is it fundamentally showing it is fundamentally showing that there is a corresponding change with respect to a change in the biology as well as the culture the reciprocatory nature of the change that is existing with respect to this 1.5 and 1.6 and that is where you would see a nature of organic evolution a nature of the mosaic evolution happening with respect to the homo sapiens right when we look at this 1.5 chapter here they are talking about the evolutionary trends they are talking about the primate adaptations right then they are talking about the primate taxonomy primate behavior all these are fundamental aspects that are being discussed about the primates as an element and from there one important section that we generally come across this particular chapter in examination is the comparative anatomy of the man and apes the skeletal changes due to erect posture and its implications this is a very very important area this is the high hot spot that is generally seen when it comes to the examination and in this section remember you might be thinking sir we need to by heart number of elements please remember my dear one simple memory technique i would like to give you when you uh, when you talk about this particular section one simple memory technique that you can remember is always divide whatever you are studying into the cranial elements as well as the post cranial elements and once you are able to divide these elements into cranial elements and the post cranial elements you know that it is very very easy for you to remember because when you talk about the cranial elements what is happening you see you see that that is with respect to the cranial elements that might be with respect to your frontal lobe that might be the temporal lobe that might be your occipital lobe that might be your foramen magnum that might be your supraorbital ridges or that might be with respect to prognathic or orthognathic appearance all these aspects would come under the cranial aspects and apart from that you can even talk about the diastema right the presence of the diastema that is what is the ca classical difference that you generally see in the context of dentition and from there you can talk about the post cranial aspects in the post cranial aspects you talk about your thorax region you talk about the anatomy of the hands you talk about the anatomy of the legs and when you talk about this here we talk about especially the pelvic region especially we talk about the vertebral column because when you see the quadrupedal kind of adaptation you see that it is all bent the vertebral column is bent and from there you see a kind of adaptation fundamentally changing into an erect posture and in this context of change in the erect posture that is happening from the vert bent vertebral column of the quadrupedal to the erect posture what you see there is vertebral column which is changing you see the five different curves that are present with respect to the vertebral column and apart from the five different curves that you see with respect to the vertebral column you also see a necessary change that is happening especially in the pelvic region and there where you talk about your acetabulum where you talk about gluteus maximus where you talk about gluteus minimus so all these are fundamental aspects that are present with respect to your pelvic region and you also see linea aspera emerging when you see this aspect of it becoming an erect posture and from there you move on to talk about the medial arches you talk about the balancing position of the foot all these aspects we can discuss so the simplest technique that you can remember whenever you are talking about the comparative anatomy whenever you are talking about the skeletal changes is move from top to toe that is an easy aspect move from top to toe right starting with your foramen magnum starting with your frontal lobe position from there you talk about your medial arches from there you talk about the balancing foot positioning right so this is what is a simple technique that we can remember okay so apart from that then when we move on to the 1.6 here what happens is now in primates what happens is you know that the most important aspect that you have to always mention is the jane goodall's study jane goodall's study with respect to your primatology jane goodall's study with respect to the social behavior also we have some other individuals like pussy at all who are fundamentally looking into the national parks like gombe national park in tanzania and when we talk about this gombe national park they are discussing about the primate behavior the social aspects of primate the social aspects of their living right so all these aspects have to be emphasized here and when you talk about 1.6 it is talking about phylogenetic status now here it is classically talking about that what is the man's position in the evolutionary line what is the man's position in the evolutionary line because that is what is the phylogenetic status fundamentally talking about that is what is the phylogenetic status 
right that might be with respect to the clark's phylogenetic status or that might be with respect to the white's the phylogenetic status so there are multiple phylogenetic status that are present or it might be a two branch or it might be three branch right so there are different lines that are present that are there are different philosophies that are talked about when you talk about the phylogenetic status of the homo erectus right not only that the neanderthals now again one simple understanding or one simple way to remember things in this is again go for a comparative approach go for a comparative approach and when you look at the comparative approach what generally happens is when you look at australopithecus or when you talk when you talk about this australopithecus signs the fundamental aspect is these are mostly primitive features these are mostly primitive features because when you look at the primitive features for example you see the frontal lobe will be protruding protruding frontal lobe deep supraorbital ridges right then prognathic kind of dentition that is present the presence of diastema so all, all of this and again you would see the positioning of the foramen magnum is not central so what uh, what are these features fundamentally showing is these are showing that primitive features are dominant in the australopithecus and when you move on to the kind of evolution that you see that you see that these primitive features suddenly changing into derived features which are more advanced in nature if you are able to show that kind of advancement that is generally seen because any sort of advancement that happened across the evolution is a resultant of the bipedal structure the bipedalism as a phenomena not only that but also the erect posture whatever physiological changes that have occurred with respect to the kind of organic evolution that is seen in 1.6 is majorly driven by the bipedal structure as well as the erect posture right so once you are able to understand this basic concept of the physiological change you know on the basis of the biocultural approach you know that you would be able to decipher that the corresponding change in the physiology would have resulted in the corresponding change in the culture right because what happens is when you talk about the homo habilis you call the homo habilis as handy man then apart from that when you talk about homo erectus you would have seen the onset of fire you would have seen the onset of dwelling systems you would have seen the onset of cave dwellings you would have seen the onset of the clothing pattern somewhere here and there that you generally observe because that individual has become erect posture and apart from that with the erect posture you would have seen that there is a variation in the dentition that is happening and suddenly slowly what is happening is you see that the prognathic structure becoming orthognathic structure and with that kind of dentition what happens is you see that the homo erectus is more used to the cooked food rather than the raw food so such kind of cultural changes are fundamentally driven by the physiological changes and all of these physiological changes are driven by the bipedal and the erect posture so with that kind of understanding we can talk about then you talk about the rhodesian man you talk about the homo sapiens that is cromagnon grimaldi chancellor again whenever you are reading this go for a comparative approach comparative approach right right in the future classes maybe whenever we get time we see that there are around 15 or 10 to 12 kind of parameters we can keep it constant right we can keep those 10 to 12 parameters which are constant and we can evaluate all of those parameters in this aspect okay so with that kind of understanding we can finish this chapter trust me my dear in this if you go for a comparative approach it is very very easy to remember it is never an herculean task for you to remember this kind of chapter then moving on to 1.8 now here here in this 1.8 now this 1.8 fundamentally talks about the prehistoric archaeology the chronology the geological time scale and also the relative and absolute dating methods and when i talk about this relative and absolute dating methods fundamentally it is talking about the various ways of evaluation of different objects different fossils that are that are excavated in this process of archaeology and here that is fundamentally saying that absolute dating method fundamentally means that you are able to position the kind of the timing especially categorically in the geological time scale whereas relative we have a reference material we have a reference time period and to that reference we are able to position that is what is called as relative you have number of methods that are generally seen when you talk about the carbon dating the most famous that you talk about is the c14 that is the carbon dating method that is which is a kind of absolute when you talk about relative you have something called as spatiation you have something called as stratification methods or you have something called as thermoluminescent method all these are what all these are mostly the relative kind of dating methods that are generally present 
and from there we went on to discuss or you can see that the cultural evolution cultural evolution and there they are talking about paleolithic mesolithic neolithic chalcolithic copper bronze age and iron age and please understand the major aspects that you need to remember with respect to this 1.8 and the here here you majorly talk about the world cultures and not only the world cultures my dear here we also talk about not only the world cultures but one cat categorical section has to be awarded to the indian part to the indian part that you generally study in the chapter 1.1 and 1.2 of paper 2 that has to be interlinked here if you are not bringing in the dimension please understand that you are losing some marks there because at the end of the day we are we are positioned in india and we have certainly to talk about the indian archaeological systems whenever we are discussing this and when you look at this mostly either the world cultures either the european culture or either the middle east culture or either the far east culture so all of these are fundamentally talked about when you talk about this cultural evolution that is might be with respect to paleolithic right paleolithic mesolithic neolithic chalcolithic and copper bronze and iron age and one thing you need to remember with respect to these understandings is that you should be able to interlink the primate aspect to it because when you talk about the primate aspect we know that the culture has been evolving from homo habilis to homo erectus to neanderthal there was a cultural evolution that majorly happened in this context that you see that lower paleolithic the middle paleolithic and the upper paleolithic in the upper paleolithic you would have seen the evolution of the homo sapien happening to a larger extent right homo sapien happening to a larger extent and that is fundamentally characterized with respect to the corresponding change in the culture that is observed so that has to be spoken about then whenever we are discussing about iron age whenever we are discussing about iron age we certainly have to talk about the aspects that are existing with respect to the megalithic culture megalithic culture because your iron age is characterized with megalithic culture right then with such a kind of understanding of this chapter you can straight away move to the neo evolutionism that we generally discuss and here also there is an element that we generally state because when you look at the neo evolutionists you see that is a kind of advancement that is done to the 19th century evolutionists that are who are talking about the cultural evolution when you talk about the 19th century evolutionists that might be your eb taylor that might be your lh morgan or that might be with respect to your james fraser although all of them were armchair anthropologists but to an extent the lh morgan had had different kind of the research methodology but you see a kind of necessary advancements have been made by the neo evolutionists which are the 20th century evolutionist theory and when you look at this what happens is when you look at this all of them the gv child lesley alvin white julian h stewart solins and service all of them categorically talk about a relation that is existing with respect to the lithic cultures a relation that is existing with respect to the lithic cultures and when you talk about this lithic culture from there they derive the cultural evolution happening and they would decipher or they would differ with respect to on the basis of what are the forces that are resulting in the context of cultural evolution because when you look at gv child gv child talks about the neolithic culture as a revolution in his book what happened in history and when you talk about lesley alvin white it talks about the culture energy approach and when you talk about the culture energy approach where he talks about c equal, c equals to e into t he says that these lithic culture or the cultural evolution that happened across your paleo across your meso across your neo what it considers is there is a variation that is existing with respect to the technology as well as the energy and with such a kind of variation it is seen that the culture happens to progress then when you talk about julian h stewart when you talk about the julian h stewart julian h stewart talks about the culture ecology approach the culture ecology approach and the julian h stewart categorically states it is culture ecology approach in states that the ecology has been the force for cultural evolution and in that context the lithic cultures have been evolved and when you talk about the solins and service it talks about the biocultural approach it talks about the evolution in the context of specific evolution and general evolution categorically and apart from that from there when we move on to talk about the other aspects that are related to archaeology we can talk about the field work traditions in anthropology here the field work traditions in the case of anthropology especially the archaeological anthropology you see when you go back and refer the 2018 question paper there was 
uh, 15 marker that was asked in the context of what are the various field methods that are used with respect to archaeological anthropology. In that context, we need to understand. Because what happens is, it is majorly surveying that we see in the context of the archaeology. Not only the surveying, we see also the excavation process. Because you would see that there are various excavation process, there are various identification process that are involved with respect to this. Because when you look at the development of this kind of the field methodology or the field work methodology in archaeological anthropology, you see number of fuzzy logics being used, you see number of radiometric techniques being used, you see number of resistivity and the conductivity principles being used in the context of surveying. So, all those have to be incorporated whenever we are discussing about this archaeological anthropology. Then from there we go on to discuss about the paper 2 that is 1.1, 1.2 and 1.3. Again please understand my dear. Now here the prehistoric that is we know the Paleolithic, the Mesolithic, the Neolithic and the Neo-Chalcolithic these have to be linked to 1.8. Because what you understand is among these cultures you see that the tools and the tool technologies in whatever you learn as part of whatever you learn as part of the chapter 1.8 in the world cultures is going to be applied here. And one special kind of emphasis that generally UPSC makes is the Indus Valley Civilization and every alternate year you come across a different kind of questioning with respect to the Indus Civilization that might be with respect to its society, that might be it's with respect to the urban planning, that might be it with, with respect to the religious aspect or that might be it with, with respect to the social network or the society that was existing or that might be with respect to the origin as well as the the declining theories of Indus Valley Civilization. Then again it talks about pre-Harappan, Harappan and post-Harappan cultures. Right? Now with, a, with such a kind of understanding, the last bit is contribution of the tribal cultures to the Indus Valley Civilization. Now here what is it talking about here, the contribution of tribal cultures to the Indus, Indian Civilization. Here it is talking about that how, what is the reciprocatory nature or how is the cultures of tribe and the cultures of India reciprocal in nature. That is what to be emphasized in this particular context, right? It talks about the bow and arrow concept, it talks about the Ayurvedic concepts, it talks about the traditional methods of healing concept, it talks about the sacrifices, it talks about the practices, the ritual practices, all of those are derived from the tribal culture. That is what is the understanding and you see that culture is never one side, culture is never linear, culture is a reciprocal phenomena. That is what is generally seen in the cultureology theory of Leslie Alvin White, right? So on Considering that kind of context here, that is what is can be interlinked here. Then apart from that, when you talk about 1.2, that is paleo-anthropological evidences from India. And here we know that it is Narmada man, it is Rama Pithikas and Shiva Pithikas. These three are again standalone questions which are generally asked. And please remember my dear, whenever we are coming across here, we here we are supposed to be talking about the geographical distribution. Once we talk about the geographical distribution, we also have to talk about what are the nature or what is the nature of the fossil that has been excavated by multiple individuals. And from there, we have to understand what are the drawings. We have to understand what are the drawings because when you look at these three fossils, that is the Rama Pithikas, Shiva Pithikas and Narmada man, because what happens is we have to see what is their position in the evolutionary line, especially the phylogeny, that is where is the conflict lying that is where is the conflict lying that is especially with respect to the Sankhyan theory or the Sonakyan theory where you see that the position of Narmada man, the phylogeny of Narmada man is what is in conflict, right? With such a kind of understanding, this second chapter is a straightforward or 1.2 is a straightforward understanding. Then moving on to the 1.3 that is ethno-archaeology and when you talk about ethno-archaeology, it is fundamentally talking about looking at the present existence, what was the past, that is what is the understanding, looking at the cultural presence, looking at the cultural survivals and parallels because this concept of cultural survivals and parallels was derived from the E.V. Tyler's theory of evolutionism. And from there you see survivals and parallels among hunting, among foraging, among fishing, among pastoral, among peasant. So there are multiple studies that are generally done, it might be with respect to the chanchus that are generally seen or it might be with respect to the thodas or it might be the study of the MLK Murti that is generally done in the regions of Andhra Pradesh. So all these aspects have to be discussed because here it is always a very very important area for UPSC that it asks what are the learnings of ethno-archaeology. What are the learnings of ethno-archaeology? What is the significance of ethno-archaeology? Because in the significance of ethno-archaeology, the present existence of 
certain past culture will talk about the society of the past culture that is what is the understanding deriving or understanding the past societies with the existence of present societies that is what is a kind of understanding that is where they talk about survivals and parallels right that is what is to be understood with respect to the ethno archaeology and here we have to talk about the binford's study of ethno archaeology the binford's study of ethno archaeology which becomes very very important in the context of this right so with such a kind of understanding when you look at this archaeology and primatology as a subject trust me my dear it is a simple thing and when you try to understand these broader aspects and when you try to decipher what is the hot area and what is the important sections in this particular thing trust me it is not going to trouble you because most of the people most of the aspirants would get scared of learning anthropology because of these sections and these sections trust me these are never factual but these are a logical arrangement of various facts if you understand that what is the logic behind and if you understand certain memorization techniques these sections are very very easy right so this is the second part that we have done as part of the dias program and it, very soon we would be coming up with the third part and the fourth part and the fifth part right and later on we would come up with certain aspects and the certain programs regarding the anthropology interlinking and the value addition of anthropology right that's it for today thank you